do you use and like bicycles? I haven't really biked in a while, but yeah, I, I do own a bicycle and I kind of like, I like cycling, but uh, I'm not very good at it because I, I lack the, the necessary practice. <clears throat> yeah, I've seen, once I started streaming, I've seen more Grand Prix attack than I have seen in my entire career as a pro chess player, which is kind of funny. Are there bike lanes in St. Petersburg? Yeah, in some places of the town, yeah. Not nearly as many as, let's say, in Amsterdam, yeah. This is like, maybe I'm not even supposed to play six, right? I'm supposed to play knight h6 here or something? Because this is a problem. And I sort of knew this was a problem as well. And then I, quote unquote, decided to ignore that knowledge, uh, which is not very bright. Is king e7 better than bishop f8 is the, the burning question of the day here. I'm going to go with bishop f8, but I guess e5 kind of wins, which is a problem here. I blundered an c7 check at the end of that line. Maybe I can go e5, d5 and pretend I'm not lost. It's a very sad state of affairs when you have to play this. Yeah, okay, I also blundered this, I guess. But is this so great? Maybe it is, maybe it is. It's confusing though, because it does give me some tempi to develop. Can I play e5 here? Like I could just be completely lost here for all I know, but if I if I don't lose in the next five moves or so, this might become a playable-ish position. Yeah, it is it is a very confusing line because uh, my opponent appears to be breaking you know every rule known to man, but uh, he is prompting me to make very very ugly moves in response. So it's a it's a very concrete line which which does make sense on this level. Queen d3, not what I expected. Yeah, and this now kind of gives me, I think my position now is kind of fine simply. Uh, yes, there is, a <coughs> there is a hole on d5, but you know, what we, what we end up having here is some kind of a perfectly normal, you know, Sveshnikov slash something type position where, you know, the white queen is on d3 where it's in the way. I can play b5, bishop b6 and so on. I'm, I don't think I'm in any kind of trouble anymore. Explains, <laughs> yeah, uh, explains why you're seeing so many Grand Prix. It's it's basically because I have not, in all my years, I have not actually managed to <clears throat> to learn any theory of it. Uh, so it does make definite sense to continue playing it against me. Uh, since I appear to be absolutely clueless. Who would be the most hilarious but probably useless coach in chess? Um... Don't know. Uh, it's a kind of a loaded question, obviously. There are some tremendous stories. Uh, it's a name that I think in this chat, probably not not very many, uh, not very many people in this chat will know who I'm talking about. But there was this guy uh, called uh, Rudolf Zaginov. He's probably still around somewhere. I I hope because you know the, the alternative is not very pleasant to think of. He used to be a uh, a tennis uh, like mindset coach and then he went from tennis into chess and he helped uh, I want to say Nana Yoseliani or it's been a while since I returned to those stories so I don't remember exactly but he helped some Georgian female very strong Georgian female players I think bishop takes d5 followed by knight e7 kind of wins the pawn on d5, but I might have better. Like f5 is probably uh, more aggressive. <laughs> oh yes, he helped Karana with his serve. Yeah, something like that. Um, and uh, uh, and after after helping uh, those uh, those women players, he went on to help Karpov for a period. And he wrote a book about him helping Karpov in the candidate matches of... I think it was when the, the federations got split and Karpov was playing like the feeder cycle when Kasparov and Nigel were playing uh, that cycle. And he wrote, he wrote a book about his experiences with Karpov. 
Yeah, I kind of missed how unpleasant knight g5 will be here. I should not have played. And bishop takes d5 was just such a safe, safe advantage. I really kind of regret my choices, but maybe it's still fine. Uh, he wrote a book which I think was just called Defeat, which was a little bit of a spo spoiler, frankly, uh, as regards to, uh, it, uh, you know, the the contents of the book. Uh, GF would be very nice if not if, if not for a four, which is like a very standard reply here. So I think, yeah, I've I've I should not have done this. I'm very unhappy with myself right now. I'm still doing fine though. Uh, because I have h6. Knight should actually go to h3, not f3, because knight f3, e4 is kind of awkward. But even after knight h3, there is there is an issue with this guy. Yeah, favorite person to comment with, with is still is and probably will always remain Gusti. Although commentating with uh, Grishuk probably comes as a close second. And the three of us is the absolute, absolute dream scenario. Like me, Gusti as a kind of a moderator, plus you know, very very sharp mind actually, uh, and and Sasha that would be uh, like the absolute dream team in my opinion. But I have been very very lucky uh, with uh, colleagues throughout my career. Actually, I've enjoyed working with the American crew. I've enjoyed working with Alejandro. I once worked with Alejandro, like just the two of us for the Qatar Rapid in, not not Rapid, Qatar Open, I think 2015. Uh, that was tremendous fun as well. Yeah, you can you can use any challenge. It's just that you are, you're going to be one of 180 people challenging me right now. So considering I'm clicking accept, accept random challenge here, uh, nobody really has a, very high mathematical chance of getting a game, but everybody has the same chance, so I think it's fair. Why am I allowing d5 here? I think I've had this game before. I think I've already made this mistake on stream in some previous tournaments. So yeah, returning to, to, to Zaginov. Uh, Zaginov published that book, and the thing about him was that uh, I don't think he is a very, very good mindset coach, uh, but he is like an, an absolutely incorrigible graphomaniac, and he just couldn't stop himself. He couldn't like refrain from putting sort of absolute truth in a book, uh, and that resulted in very, very hilarious outcomes because. Um, he would describe something he thought was, you know, a very, you know, a very profound way to inspire his, uh, uh, inspire his client to, to greater length. <laughs> and then you read that description and you think, but that's absolutely horrible. Why would you say that to anybody before, before the game? And, uh, yeah, some of those stories are, Really remarkable. Like the one that stuck in my mind the most was uh, Karpov was trailing 5-4 um, in, in his like final candidates game against... Who was he playing? I think he was playing short, actually, yeah? Uh, and uh, as Karpov is heading towards that absolute decider which he needs to win uh, to stay in the match... Zagayanov decides to ask him a few questions to get him in the proper, like, fighting frame of mind. I don't remember the second question, but the first question was, Anatoly, your father died when you were seven. Uh, what did you feel at that moment? And I thought, like, I, I got to that point and I thought, but why would you ever do that? Like, how is it ever a good idea to ask that of a man even maybe outside of what was happening in the tournament but but like like how how do you stumble upon the idea of asking that of anybody <laughs> it was just it was just absolutely remarkable to me
I'm not I'm I'm sort of worse now, but I'm maybe not as lost as I thought. And you really aren't supposed to like playing G4 in this position is just a mistake because of G5. So I'm sort of fighting for equality there. Yeah, I mean, it's. I understand that uh, the, the pain, the pain, it becomes duller with time and so on. I, I, I agree with your, uh, with your statement, Babadav. But it's still, it, you know, it wouldn't strike me as the most obvious way to, you know, inspire your charge before an incredibly important game. I don't know why I chose this square. Probably H six was a lot better. Can you maybe share some Ivanchuk story? Uh, my my like my favorite Ivanchuk story is very very uh, reliant on people who I tell it to understanding Russian, uh, which I assume is not the case in this chat. So um, this is a kind of a weird little tactic which semi works. I don't know how I how what the response is to Rook G seven though. I might not have a good response to Rook G seven at all actually. If he takes, we go here, here, and then, and then there. But yeah, I can't, I can't really refute rook g7 so far. I'll try telling it because I think it's a funny story nonetheless. But without, uh, without the understanding of Russian, uh, the final slightly not suitable for war, uh, for for work, twist to the story gets lost. So, I still think it's a. Funny ish story, yeah. Why did I why did I allow this? Also I have forty seconds. So the story goes as follows. That was probably during my first Evo Linares. Uh no, probably not the greatest game of all time. It is very good though. R's five to one. Yeah, if I wanted to go bishop c8, I should have played on the previous move, clearly. Like it just makes no sense whatsoever to do it with one with one move delay. Um so this is probably my first ever Linares. And uh, I don't know how well, yeah, I assume you probably don't actually know it very well, but f5 sort of the only move in this position, or f6. Otherwise, I get, I, get, I give mate along the h file. <sighs> um, um, so in Linares, uh, basically, the, the the tournament is centered around the the Anibal Hotel, the the hotel the players stay in. I don't know what this bishop c5 move is all about. I should be bringing my rook back out. It's a really bizarre move I just made. I have no idea what prompted me to play that. Makes no sense whatsoever. Anyway, so the entire the entire tournament is kind of centered around the uh, around Anibal Hotel. And uh, the players, I should have played bishop g5. What the hell am I doing? Um, the players kind of aggregate in the lobby. And uh, in order to get to the playing hall, you go sort of through the restaurant. And there's a separate answer entrance as well for uh, the playing hall area of the hotel. And uh, there is an industry associated with that tournament. Or at least there was. I, don't, I really don't know what's happening there these days, but... Uh, in the years that that I was playing there, there was a there was a specific industry uh, uh, w that went with the I don't know what I'm doing. Like this is just wrong. It's very possible to take this, and there's like no penalty. Uh, yeah, and now my position is just worse than it was for no reason. I'm sort of actively trying to lose this position for some mysterious unknown reason. If he goes rook f6, I'm probably making a draw, but still not sure. Uh, the end game that we got was probably equal, but yeah, I I've, I've, I've really sh was not supposed to, to give up that A-pawn. There was, there was absolutely no call. Uh, no call to do that at all. Yeah, returning to the story. So, uh, the industry 
uh, was basically there were a bunch of reasonably small kids who would uh, hustle for autographs. Uh, that's actually quite clever. With the king on a3, this probably does end up winning the game. This is a very nicely played game by by my opponent starting from my absolutely idiotic decision to play a4, which I just have no explanation for whatsoever. I have no idea what could have possibly prompted me to do that. Uh, so there's this, this gang of kids around, I don't know, 10 to 12 years old who uh, ask you for autographs every day. Let's offer a draw because I think I probably will be able to flag my opponent here if we continue, uh, but I don't really want to because he's played kind of well. <clears throat> um, is there an increment? There appears to not be any increment, right? I, I mean, I, I appreciate the the fighting spirit and all that, but Let me try this again. Okay, I, I can't actually offer a second draw, I guess. Uh, I'm probably actually kind of still losing, yeah? Shockingly, because... Uh, huh, am I? Probably not, right? We do this, and then we do this, and we do this, and this, and this. <clears throat> and this is a draw. Um, ah, okay. With the two-second increment, I should not have offered that draw. I apologize. I, I, for some reason, I assumed there was no increment, and then, uh, and then, of, of course, I should, I should be, like, I felt like I probably might even win this game, and that would have been a little bit of a travesty. Um, uh, I apologize for the, if you if you're listening. I apologize for the offer. The offer was only prompted by me for some reason thinking this is a a three zero game. I I can actually see it on my screen. I don't know why I can't read it. It says three plus two on my screen. Uh, yeah, uh, the story will eventually end. I understand there is a problem with telling stories. I actually am going to abort this one. Sorry, because I've already played this person today. This appears to be a glitch. But I really should not be playing the same person sec second time in a row when there's 180 uh, unanswered challenges in my list. Uh, really doesn't feel like a good idea to give somebody two games when we give most people no games at all. Um, yeah, more, more fun. More fun Grand Prix action. Yeah, back to the endless story about, uh, about autographs. Uh, and it was quite clear f to anybody who would watch them for like more than one day uh, that <clears throat> they were basically doing it f to earn money uh, because they would like bring 15 or however many of those uh, tournament bulletins. And that was in the years when, you know, term I don't know why it took with a deep one. This is very clever and once again shows just how horrible my understanding of... Um, of uh, Grand Prix uh, move orders is. Uh, I really should not be replying to it with this. Um, so they would bring like 15 of those tournament bulletins and you would sign all 15 and then they would be the ne back the next day with another 15. And uh, at this point you sort of realize that they're not doing it for themselves. They're doing this to, to eventually sell them to, I don't know, their friends and family and whoever. Um, yeah, four a four is excellent. There, it's uh, it's very good to stop e five in that fashion. Uh, 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 Rick, Rick and Harp. Uh, I would like you to trust me on this. It's the absolutely correct way to play. You go a four knight of three, and you are, yeah, quite happy about that. Uh, so I think I've set up the. 
the story enough. And one more thing to you need to know about Linares in those years is that, uh, I mean, Kasparov was obviously an absolute beast in those years. He would win, uh, he would win a, a lot of tournaments. He 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 always like started as a favorite, of course. But maybe the biggest local favorite in terms of like affection of the locals. Let's put it. Let's put it in those terms. Uh, was Vasily Ivanchuk. Uh, who, uh, you know, at the break of uh, like early 90s to mid 90s, he won maybe two or three Linares. Uh, some of them actually uh, ahead of Kasparov. Uh, he, he won a very, I plundered the pawn on c5 and my opponent decided not to take it, which is a very good development for me, of course. Uh, so, you know, the, <coughs> the, lo <coughs> the local people really idolized Chucky and felt he was the best things in sliced bread and they were not <clears throat> they were not wrong about it either this is quite clever i i quite like how my opponent is uh treating this i'm obviously in a tremendous amount of trouble here uh probably lost um but i've misplayed the like i i played a very very speculative thing in the opening there which uh, i am now in the process of being punished before Anyway, back to uh, back to the story. So, I think this is all the setting, uh, all the setting of the scene I need to do here. So one evening, I am coming back from my walk, and I see uh, Gary uh, in front of that separate entrance to the tournament hall, standing there talking to uh, Dirk Janten Hertzendam who is the um, chief editor of uh, the New in Chess magazine. Some of you would know that name if you don't. He is a very important person in terms of sort of understanding chess journalism and the history of chess journalism. He is, you know, probably the most influential chess journalist of the past, I don't know how many years. This is still actually, despite the fact that I managed to uh, swindle my opponent and win a piece, this is still not a very clear position. Anyway, so they, st they, they stand there talking, uh, and then uh, the, kids, uh, the kids run up to them, and they start uh, kind of shouting. And also you have to understand that this is a part of Spain where they don't pronounce very many letters. So, for instance, my name was uh, habitually pronounced as uh, Bidle. Because they, they particularly don't like pronouncing the, f the, the first letter S, in particular if it's, uh, if it's uh, in front of a uh, person's name. So I would be Bidle. And uh, Gary they, they called Caparo. Uh, so they, they've approached uh, Gary and, uh, and Dirkian and they started shouting, Caparo, Caparo, firma, firma, which, which is Spanish for signature, signature. And he quite politely says, says no. The first time they asked, it was a very kind of, it was a very firm, but a very polite no. And there's like three or four of them. Uh, so they make quite a lot of noise. And uh, yeah, it does kind of mean, not, not exactly a hillbilly, but a, it's very close to our, uh, to a, uh, word that you do not want to be described by in Russian, uh, Turlock. Good of you to spot that. <clears throat> so they, uh, they take a break of like 20 seconds. Uh, Gary returns to his conversation with Dirkian. Uh, and then they go, they go again. They go, Kaparo, Kaparo, firma, firma. And he, at this point, slightly annoyed, as he has every right to be, says, no. And... Uh, because I have actually uh, removed it, it uh, I kind of don't like it on my screen. I probably could go into the settings and uh, and get it back up, but I like for me personally, I don't really know them to need the. I don't really need to know the the material advantage disadvantage Iverson. and I will I will do it after this game. It's basically you are watching this with my settings, 
uh, like this is how I would be playing if I were playing on my account for my for my, yeah, a five is a bad move because of nine b five. I I'm auto piloting here uh, and making mistakes because of auto piloting, which is very normal. I think I'm supposed to play five here, but yeah, like this I've played this a little bit too naively. Like my my last few moves here were all played without really engaging the brain and that normally doesn't work out very well for you at least in my experience it's not really the zen mode it's specifically i was asked about the uh the material disbalance not not the zen mode uh i have consciously disabled the the who is upper rook filter yeah finish the story exactly yeah so they go they go again and he says no they go again and by this point he is really annoyed so he kind of half barks at them and says no and they realize they're probably not getting any autographs but something needs to be done right so they and i think it was some kind of a hive mind situation because they did not they did not uh really as I remember the story, they did not coordinate anything. There wasn't any kind of a conversation, like a a board meeting of the kids. They just randomly decided this was the correct reply. They ran back a little bit to kind of put a little bit of a buffer of a distance between him and Kasparov. And then they just started uh, shouting in unison, Ibanchuk! Ibanchuk! Uh, to kind of show Gary that now that he has refused the, the autographs, he is not going to be their favorite player. I can take on A8, but I don't really need to. <clears throat> Yeah, and as mentioned, uh, I think it's a funny story anyway, but it's uh, it's slightly funnier for not for for us Russians because uh, once again, because of the Spanish, uh, the, the way the the, the, the Spanish, uh, at least in this particular area of Spain, pronounce various sounds, the the V in Vasily's name kind of turns into the B, making it into a swear word. So it really made it the whole story absolutely gorgeous for us. <laughs> 